<laughs> so uh, thank you for coming here today. Um, so this talk is mainly aimed at um, like a really physical therapy. Um, we see some vestibular patients. Um, and I'm, I'm going to assume that some you have some familiarity with um, some of the diagnoses we're going to be talking about there. Um, but also for um, probably for like primary care th uh, physicians um, and possibly occupational therapists working with um, subacute to chronic concussion, because some of the principles we're going to talk about that apply to um, to uh, dizzy patients are also going to apply to concussion patients who can also be dizzy. Um, so why am I interested in this? Um, I certainly have seen dizzy patients um, that don't fit into like really good categories like like positional vertigo, um, hypofunction, um, and whose symptoms can be somewhat nonspecific. Um, the concept of hypervigilance, which we're going to talk about a lot today, um, which can be seen in the, the diagram here, um, applies to a lot of different vestibular patients, um, also concussion and chronic pain patients. Um, it's important to understand the kind of the cycle and how we try to break the cycle of hypervigilance. Um, also, just a, a lot of ideas behind um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which we're going to talk about briefly. Um, it's going to be practiced with a lot of our patients, um, really in any setting. Um, and one caveat before I continue here is that um, you know, I've seen some patients with uh, 3PD, and they could be counted on this hand here. Um, so I don't have a ton of experience. Um, with this, but I think it's something that really hasn't been a diagnostic category um, before 2014. So kind of we're all kind of learning and um, learning how to manage and help these uh, these type of patients. Okay, so we're going to start with a scenario, um, and it's probably familiar to a lot of us. Um, so the scenario is this. Uh, you drank too much, and you lay down, and the room is spinning. So questions, why is the room spinning? Um, you know, if you look at it physiologically, um, we know that the fluid density around our cupula in the inner ear, it has changed and that we become very, very sensitive to motion. Um, when we lay down and close our eyes, we're limiting visual information. Um, and we know that our vestibular system is not on its best behavior because we weren't on our best behavior. Um, so the question is, is this, does it, this affect current and future behavior? Um, yes. So we likely should learn from what happened. Um, but the question is, what if, if this sensitivity to motion or sensitivity to visual motion continued unabated? Um, so we're dealing with chronic dizziness here. Um, and this is kind of one thing I could relate to from my past. Um, so learning objectives here um, talk about how 3PD overlaps with other vestibular diagnosis, um, how does 3PD um, different from other diagnoses. And when I say 3PD, it's the persistent perceptual postural dizziness. Um, it, you can say it triple PD to distinguish it from benign positional vertigo, um, or I'll, I'm going to call it 3PD throughout the presentation here, because um, I'll get the order wrong sometimes. Um, we're going to uh, talk about how we evaluate a patient with chronic dizziness, um, and the diagnosis is largely based on the patient history. Um, we're going to talk about treatment programs which relate to patient education, uh, vestibular rehab, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, medication, and the combinations of the above. Um, we'll talk briefly again about the precepts of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, we're going to discuss when patients are going to benefit from a referral there. Um, talk about the principles of vestibular rehab for 3PD, which also applies to really a lot of our patients in general. Um, talk briefly about medication and medical management of patients with 3PD. And then um, talk briefly about how successful we expect to be with these patients. Um, so we're going to give you a patient history, kind of keep in mind um, as you go through these, um, that of course a lot of these patients aren't really diagnosed with 3PD when they walk in the door, sometimes they are, um, but a lot of these patients are patients that have been referred for dizziness um, or they've, been, they've, they've had like positional vertigo and they come back for something else or uh, they had a hypofunction that kind of evolved into something else. So um, this patient that we're going to talk about is 50 years old, um, female, referred for vertigo, um, very common um, four months history of dizziness. We'll talk about what she means more by that. Um, the average length to diagnosis for this diagnosis is, or length to before the diagnosis, four and a half years. 
Um, so it's quite a bit of time. A lot of these people have kind of been moved around between neurology or ENTs or primary care physicians or cardiology or psychology, and they might have had uh, CT scans or blood work or VNGs or MRIs and all kinds of things. Um, and a lot of times they're not getting a, like a definitive answer. Like they don't know quite what's wrong with this person. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, so this person, their vertigo, or their, they had vertigo um, upon waking um, and they felt nauseous and they had slightly better the next day. Um, and there was no like injury, acute injury or illness associated with this. Um, so what are some things on the table with this? I would probably put, you know, based on this history, you can go ahead and shout them out. BPVV. Okay, positional vertigo, BPVV, anything else? Hypofunction. Hypofunction. What else? I mean, it, you can shout out the things that might be a little bit less likely than those. I would, I'd put those right at the top of the list. Vestibular yeah. migraines, yep. I mean, it might be a cardiovascular cause. I mean, you can't, from this, you can't really rule out even like central vestibular disorders like, uh, you know, a, a certain types of stroke or, um, so a lot of things should be on the table at this point. Um, so now you're seeing this patient, they're walking to the door four months later. Um, they're reporting imbalance and dizziness of movement, and it's really causing some participation in functional effects. So they're not, um, they're kind of tentative to go to the grocery store. Um, they won't go and drive for a couple hours. Um, they uh, didn't have any falls, but they feel like they're frequently imbalanced. Um, this patient does have a history of anxiety and migraine, which go along with a ton of other vestibular diagnoses. Um, they live with the husband, uh, two kids away in college, and she works at a bank and reports some symptoms when she uses a computer screen. Um, her goal in coming to therapy is don't feel dizzy. Um, note that she still is able to work. Um, and she also reported that um, little or no symptoms sometimes um, first thing in the morning, but mostly she feels dizzy most of, most of the time. So um, there are three or five criteria that I'm going to review um, about 3PD that for the diagnosis of it. It's a clinical diagnosis. Um, it, so one of the things that we should see is that most days they're dizzy. Um, it has to be at least half the days out of the month. Um, it has to be present for at least three months. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it needs it, that, that criteria. And we're going to talk about a little bit why we want to refer somebody to say like cognitive behavioral therapy before that, before it truly becomes persistent. Um, it, it is exacerbated by movement. Um, movement can be self-movement, meaning that you're bending over to pick something up. It can be passive movement, meaning you're in a car. Um, and then in terms of exposure to uh, complex uh, visual stimuli, so if, like our uh, our carpet within our clinic here or the rug um, up there, um, the thing doesn't even have to be moving. So just exposure to those things. Um, we'll go over a list of common kind of precipitants of 3PD, um, but really a lot of the common precipitants are central or peripheral vestibular disorders. Um, there can be other things like uh, orthostasis, POTS, dysautonomia, um, the, one of the points is that it's chronic, it doesn't go away, and it doesn't really spontaneously resolve. So that's why it's important to really recognize um, what we're dealing with um, and be able to effectively deal with it. Um, it does have an association um, with psychogenic illness, but it's really not a precondition. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the history of it, um, but it, it certainly does not have to have a, um, a psychogenic or a kind of a, a mental uh, causation. Um, so a brief history, um, in the 1970s, um, the three German physicians described syndromes of dizziness accompanied by motion rich environment, um, autonomic arousal anxiety and avoidance of pro provocative circumstances. <laughs> um, so a little bit of a kind of sideline. So why is vertigo itself associated with nausea? So why does something in your inner ear cause you to want to vomit? Um, there is some evidence evolutionary that there's an advantage to be able to, like, say, if you ate something that was poisonous, to be able to vomit it. Um, it's mediated by some receptors within your gut and in your brain stem called the solitary nucleus. Um, now, our, when we organize sensory information, that kind of flows into some of the same areas. So that kind of the connection is that vestibular input 
can cause all the a, a lot of these um, other effects. Um, so in the 1980s, um, the term was phobic postural vertigo. So you know, phobic fear of. Um, but we're going to talk about how 3PD isn't really a, it's not a psychological process, it's a functional process. Um, another term in, in the 80, 1980s is called space motion discomfort. And some of the terms you see there, those are pretty interesting terms, motorist vestibular disorientation syndrome. So um, like people would actually change cars because they felt like they were dizzy in a certain car and at certain speeds. Um, Another uh, kind of kind of wastebasket term, uh, supermarket syndrome. So people would get um, dizzy if they're walking down the aisle of a uh, supermarket. Um, in the 1990s, the, the term visual vertigo was coined, kind of describes some of the things we talked about before. Um, so complex uh, visual patterns and visual motion. So sense of dizziness with those kind of things. Um, and then the, in the 2000s, the term chronic subjective dizziness, which is really similar to what we're talking about today. So kind of one of the caveats is some of the things I'm going to borrow from in terms of 3PD are really are, are some of the research is based on like chronic subjective dizziness because they're pretty hard to distinguish. Um, so here's what we're talking about for diagnosis. For a diagnosis of 3PD, all um, six uh, items here, I flip back and forth, need to be present. Um, they don't need to be present consistently, but the person is going to report dizziness most of the time. Um, this kind of, as in chronic pain, um, it does seem like after a while, um, dizziness can become a little bit more diffuse. So somebody is going to have a little bit harder time to, determining what exactly made them dizzy. Um, and there's three exacerbating factors. All three have to be present, even though they don't have to be present in the same prevalence. Um, and also note that some patients might try to avoid some of the provoking factors. Um, uh, upright posture refers to standing or walking. Um, if somebody is really severe, if you put them like on a plant and they don't have a back to it, they might feel dizzy just even in that. So um, that would be more in a severe cases. Um, active, we talked about being self-generated. Um, passive, and you talked about um, some visual stimuli. Visual stimuli can be either large things, like uh, you go to an IMAX theater, watching a movie, watching traffic, looking at like a really um, busy floor pattern, or it can be small if you hold like a cell phone up and uh, or a book or computer, things that are small but held close to your, um, your eyes. Um, the uh, 3PD has an acute trigger, um, concurrent with other, it be concurrent with other vestibular syndromes. Um, if it is chronic, it tends to be related to a slower onset and progression. Um, it, item D there, that symptoms cause significant distress or functional impairments, so it has to have a functional outcome. Um, and then um, E there, symptoms are not better accounted by another disease or disorder. Um, 3PD is not a diagnosis of, of exclusion. Um, you don't have, you're, you're, it's a clinical syndrome. It's a, it's, a, it's a clinical diagnosis, meaning that you have to have those, those four, those five items, um, but you don't have to rule everything out. You can have other things accounted for within the, within the diagnosis. Um, so just as a review, uh, persistent postural perceptual dizziness, or 3PD is dizziness. Dizziness, again, is a sensation of vertigo, imbalance, or lightheadedness that is persistent, so it lasts most of the day and it lasts for at least three months. Um, it's made worse by uh, postural challenges, so changes in position, and perceptual relates to how we process the sensory information. Um, what conditions uh, seem to precipitate 3PD? Um, mainly they're the peripheral or central vestibular disorders. Um, central would also include vestibular migraine, um, panic attacks or anxiety, concussion, is a big one there, um, and dysautonomia, um, those type of things are, are less common or un undetermined. Um, so, um, but generally those things are acute. So we saw in our 50 year old woman there, she, sudden onset, um, even though she didn't really have symptoms, the same symptoms we're talking about until a few months later. Um, 
And chronic causes can um, include things like generalized anxiety disorder, um, but um, those things are generally going to progress a little bit slower. Um, so it doesn't have to have a cause. Um, generally, those causes are acute. Um, and again, it can coexist with other pathologies. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds here in terms of sensory processing. Um, I find it really interesting, and it really relates to. Um, I also I, I work at a clinic that currently um, treats uh, neurologically involved patients, but also I also treat kids. Um, so it's a really fascinating area to me. But it does relate to um, our, our dizzy patients, and relates to our concussion patients too. Um, so sensory processing is how we use sensory information, like sight, touch, um, hearing, smell, to kind of make sense of our world. Um, we rely very heavily on vision. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and a sizable part of our brain is associated with visual processing and those, those downstream connections. Um, sensory processing is not a monosynaptic process, so it's not like a reflex loop you remember from, from grad school. Um, it's very complex, and, and the outcomes aren't necessarily determined by the, in, or the kind of inputs. Um, prior experience colors how we respond to information. Um, and we talked a little bit about how it takes a long time to appropriately respond to sensory information. Um, uh, habituation is a stimulus, um, or habituation is important here, and we're going to talk about um, habituation versus uh, the opposite, which is sensitization, and um, how 3PD is a, a problem with hypervigilance, basically being too uh, sensitive to uh, information that we're getting um, from our vestibular system or even just ocular motor. Okay, so um, this, is this kind of focusing on my head so you can't really see? Okay, so anyway, you guys are here. Um, so I want you to just, you're sitting in a chair, you're, you're relatively still. I'm gonna go ahead and stand on one foot. I want you to look at the top of my head versus the something behind me. And you can probably perceive that very imperceptibly I'm moving a little bit. So what's gonna happen when I close my eyes? And you should be able to perceive that. I put my foot down there. You can't see that. Um, you see that I'm moving a little bit more. Okay, so why? I and mean, we know why because we're, we're taking away visual information and relying on somatosensory and, and vestibular information. So we are very visually dependent. Um, when I think, like if you're at a stoplight and you see the car moving next to you, or you're kind of staring ahead, um, and the car next to you moves forward, what do you do? You hit your brake really hard. Um, because you're perceiving that, that the, you're moving. And why is that? Because we're relying on visual information. And in our experience, our, the rule is that if we see things in, in our visual field that are moving, large things, then we're going to perceive that we are moving and not those large things. So like a tree doesn't move, a house doesn't move, we are moving likely. So in that situation, or <coughs> the car next to you, we're perceiving that we are moving and in fact we're wrong. Um, another example would be uh, ventriloquist. So we have two ears and we can kind of perceive where sound is coming from. Um, but really when you have a ventriloquist, you're looking at the mouth moving of the, of the dummy. Of course, of course, the sound isn't coming from there, but we're perceiving it coming from there because we're, are, we're, using, that, we're using vision and it's, it's kind of approximate anyway. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with the rubber hand illusion? One, two. Okay, give your hand a bit of a high Steve. Um, I'm going to show you guys like a quick, uh, quick video of that, and I'll kind of talk over it. Hopefully this can hmm? I'm going to skip through that there. Okay, so let me turn it down a little bit. The classic illusion has been published in 1998 by two American sport and, and, and Cohen, two American uh, neuroscientists. It is rubber hand illusion. The rubber hand illusion consists in placing. Okay, so what they're going to do is they're going to place the, their good hand on the other side of that uh, barrier there. And they, they, this is literally like a rubber hand that they're seeing in front of them. Um, now, different scenarios have like different amounts of like viewing it. But pretty much she can't see her hand. Um, so the rubber hand, what they're doing is they're taking a brush and they're, they're rubbing like their index finger. At the same time, they're rubbing the rubber hand index finger and they're going down and back and forth. So they do it for one to two minutes. 
And of course, you know, the person knows where their hand really is, okay? But then they ask them to close their eyes and then point out where their hand is. Majority of people are going to point to the rubber hand. Yeah. Okay. So that's the rubber hand illusion. So why? Um, can I go back here? Yeah. Thanks. So why are they doing that? Um, so, in our, so our rule in life is if we see something that looks like our hand and we feel it, okay, that's our hand. Um, but this kind of kind of dissociates the, the normal process. So our, our perceptions of the world are, um, you can just go back to here. Um, oh. Our perceptions of the world are rule-based, and sometimes those rule, we can use illusions to kind of break those rules. But again, that kind of points to um, the kind of the, the supremacy of visual information. So you still have that, that uh, proprioception, that somatosensory information getting to your body, um, but we're relying on, on kind of vision, saying that a rubber hand is ours. Um, so uh, background um, about sensory processing, again, is a complex task. It's not a monosynaptic uh, process. Um, what we see on the left here is a stimulus, receptor, and, and motor experiment. Um, but really what we're, what's happening is much more complex. So your vestibular inputs input to your, your vestibular nuclei, your cerebellum, your thalamus, your cortex, and that's even that's a simplified um, uh, uh, diagram. This is a little bit more involved diagram, but you can see how kind of how extensive that information it moves. Um, so the simple information is sent. One of the things we want to point out that it's sent to the, your um, reticular activating system, and that helps modulate activity within your cerebral cortex. Um, and this might be a uh, help explain why somebody with a chronic vestibular impairment um, could, re could report changes in memory. Um, so there is some documented evidence that vestibular impairments, not just 3PD, can actually change, um, can change memory because they're related to some of the same centers. Um, vestibular inputs map to the hippocampus and the amygdala, um, which are important for um, emotion, and they're also important for storage of information. So the kind of that spatial part of it if that's gone, somebody's going to have, um, also might have difficulty with their memory. Um, so prior experience with sensory information determines how we're going to respond to it. Um, and I think most of us are familiar with the kind of the ankle strategy, um, meaning that like if we, in response to a very small perturbation or a change in our center of gravity, um, we use our, our, our gastrox and our um, Dorsey flexors to kind of maintain upright position. So I'll tell you, we'll talk a little bit about a situation where this is not working against you. So if you go on a cruise ship and you um, stay on there for a few days, you're going to develop some different reflexes or different um, kind of weighing of that sensory information. So your picture here is just pretend that boat is out at sea and not just kind of listing and uh, harbor there. Um, and, and you are on that same side of the ship. You're that person there. So the ground is going to push up so that the, the ship lifts to, to that side and the ground is going to push up on their heel. Okay, So if you're standing and the ground is pushing up on your heel, what is, what's your normal response? What's, what's normally happening to your body? Uh, opposite. So if you're standing and, and, and the, the, the ground is pushing hard on your heel, that means your weight is on your heel or you're probably going backwards. Okay, so what's your response? So the ankle strategy tells us that we should we should dorsiflex and we should kind of pitch forward. Okay, but if you're on a ship doing that, you're already pitching forward. The ship is already pitching you forward. It's pushing up on your heel. You have to have a different postural response to that. So basically, one of the problems and something uh, if you guys are familiar with Malday debarkment is basically um, a program that that kind of runs in your head of how to respond to conditions on a ship that uh, continues when you get to land. Um, so again, prior experience determines how we respond to sensory information, and sometimes that response is wrong. Um, and, and talking about 3PD, it's that hypervigilance. We're, we're, we're using um, a, a prior response. Um, we got dizzy when we bent down to pick up something because we had an uncompensated vestibular hyperfunction, and that continues um, into kind of a vicious cycle. Um, a couple other examples. 
um, you got how prior experience kind of colors how we respond to information. So if you look at the difference between like a, a, a newborn crawler, so <laughs> this is um, what's called the visual cliff. Um, a newborn crawler um, will, uh, of course, there's plexiglass there, so they're not going to fall to the ground, but a newborn crawler will happily crawl to the edge and fall down if they could. Um, but an experienced crawler will, will, will learn um, and won't, that won't happen to them. The same goes for a newborn walker. A newborn or uh, experienced crawler will get to that edge and will stop. And if that same kid gets up and starts to walk, they're going to fall off that ledge again. Um, kind of interesting. But again, our prior uh, experience colors what we're going to, how we're going to respond. Um, so kind of in contrast to that um, new crawler who's happily falling off the cliff, to that older lady who is very rigid and is grabbing onto anything she can get her hands on going down the stairs. So her postural responses are very, um, very rigid based on her prior experience. Um, habituation is, is the um, decreased response to the same stimulus. So how can this woman sit on a bench in a crowded city with a dog barking and somebody yelling, uh, talking on their cell phone and a, and a um, fire hydrant or a fire hydrant going? It's because they're, they've learned how to ignore um, parts of their environment. So if she uh, actually shifts a little in the way, so maybe she hasn't completely habituated um, to that. but. If she um, was new to that environment, of course, she wouldn't be able to ignore all that, all that type of thing. Um, the opposite of that is, is sensitization, is, is increased response to a, um, a stimulus. Um, you know, think about if uh, somebody who developed a allergic to uh, allergy to um, bees, so they get stung once and they might be okay, and they they do it again and they get a whole like a systemic response. So that's the process of sensitization. Um, so what we end up with with 3PD is hypervigilance. We're very susceptible. We're very sensitive to things that we shouldn't be sensitive to. Um, it's not harming for somebody to retrieve their socks from the bottom of a, of a washer, um, but this like, kind of it starts a vicious cycle of hypervigilance. Um, so it, somebody has a, again, kind of going through this diagram quickly, um, somebody has a trigger. Um, that trigger frequently is a vestibular um, pathology, let's say like positional vertigo or hypofunction, um, and that leads to um, some high-risk postural control, control strategies. So they're walking slower, um, they're somewhat rigid um, in their movement, um, they're very uh, introspective and, and they, they monitor their, um, their movement, and you get that... Uh, Again, the prior experience can color how we how we affect the things. That top-down distortion, um, and then because of that, we get that that dizziness and unsteadiness, and that kind of feeds into we feel unsteady with movement, and we're not going to move. The kind of vicious cycle of, of uh, um, dizziness and and kind of retreat from prior experiences. Um, so, what would a patient with 3PD look like when they enter your office or, or clinic? Um, Generally, um, again, there's going to be a large overlap between the precipitating condition and 3PD. Um, and sometimes it's very hard to differentiate the, like say, the hypofunction that's not completely compensated from a true 3PD. Um, and again, symptoms of dizziness can be are very poorly defined. But generally, they're going to report um, dizziness that's really not vertiginous. So they report like cloudiness, fuzziness, fullness. Um, Unsteadiness, they're going to report imbalance. So they're going to report that they have trouble with their balance. And that's not going to be completely aligned to what you're going to see in your physical exam. Um, and again, vertigo is tends to be non spinning um, in, in this case. Um, the uh, temporal nature, so they, they're probably going to report dizziness most of the time throughout the day. They might have some small symptom-free periods that tend to be more in the morning. Um, and those aggravating factors, um, the, you know, being upright, moving, um, or the, those visual triggers are, are going to be present. Um, those aggravating factors might build up exposure, so they might be worse later in the day than they are early in the day. Um, and when you take away those aggravating factors, so they're sitting with the back to it, they're laying down, um, 
if they're standing and holding onto something, then they might do better. Uh, as I point out that quote at the end, the increasing need to view information on electronic screens in the modern world is a bane for many patients with 3PD. Um, so a couple other things in terms of history. Um, you know, how do we distinguish uh, 3PD from other disorders in terms of their history? Because it can occur simultaneously. Um, you know, we're certainly asking your patients to report their dizziness. What do you mean by dizziness? And we're getting a more, uh, say, kind of diffuse report. Um, there, um, we can also use um, some patient scales to help quantify uh, dizziness or motion sensitivity, such as the motion sensitivity quotient, uh, dizziness handicap inventory. We can look at the uh, amount of anxiety the patient has by the GAD7 scale, and we can look at and, and screen for depression, which are PHQ9. Um, again, patients can also report cognitive changes or brain fog. Um, and again, 3PD is a problem of hypersensitive to neural stimuli. Um, so we're going to ask people, you know, how they feel, and you know, maybe take initial pain or uh, initial uh, dizziness rating. But it's not something we're going to, as we treat this person, we're not going to continually ask them, you know, we did, we walked, and we turned. You know, how dizzy are we right now? Can you please rate that for me? How we do describe? We want people to be sensitive to this. We want to kind of get them out of that cycle. So examination, and again, examine, this is, take this as a grain of salt because examination results are going to vary depending on their precipitating conditions. But generally, we're not going to find like a resting the stagnant. Um, we might not find a, a, a hypofunction with a head impulse test. Um, it's unsure if balance impairments are truly associated with 3PD, at least with my understanding of it. Um, but certainly, we're, we would want to look at balance using like a Romberg, Sharpen Romberg, or tests of how a you know, patient's going to move around their community, something like the functional gait assessment. Um, and it's also a phenomenon with 3PD that their balance might improve with a concurrent, with a competing task. And it doesn't mean that they're malingering, um, but they're not being hypervigilant to their sway. Um, a couple other things in terms of examination. So their gait, they might be slower. Um, they might, all those things that you see somebody moving slower, decrease stride length, increase double leg stance time. Um, they should not report falls or generally won't report falls because they might not truly have a balance problem. Um, also, in a physical exam, um, it's important to look at vital signs or uh, autonomic disorders that might be associated with it. And again, the, the diagnosis of 3PD depends on meeting all those five criteria um, that we showed earlier. Um, it's really hard to diagnose 3PD, um, so the literature talks about using serial uh, examination, so having come, somebody come back, which is certainly an advantage of being a physical therapist. We see people again and again, um, so to truly really, uh, determine the nature of their symptoms. Um, there's good evidence that 3PD might be underdiagnosed, um, and certainly if they have an onset to a diagnosis time of four and a half years, that's probably the case. Um, the the, the you can see the, the numbers up here, um, but the, uh, the numbers vary between uh, 15 and about 25%, depending on where you are. If you're, so if you're like a, you know, within our um, same like physical therapy, if you're a center that treats neuro, um, your, your incidence might, might be higher. Um, but there was a study that, that looked at people with uh, acute or episodic dizziness, you know, a lot of you know, positional vertigo, hyperfunction, and Three to 12 months later, a quarter of them had 3PD or visual vertigo. So that's a significant amount. Um, and so that also would tell you too, if you know, if you treat somebody for positional vertigo, they get better. You know, say, you know, come back if you feel you're not, you know, you're not fully back to everything that uh, you know that you're doing before. Um, so it's important to be able to to recognize this because with treatment, these people can get better. Um, so what causes 3PD? There's kind of three kind of hypotheses. Um, functional changes in postural control mechanisms, so we, we kind of use high-risk strategies or in a code contract our, our muscles, um, just like you would if you were standing on the edge of a cliff. Um, what we can see in these people are kind of high-frequency, low-amplitude sway. Um, the next one is multisensory information processing problems. So that they're greater, they're fully, they're mostly dependent on visual information 
um, rather than using vestibular or, or, or some of that sensory information. And then just changes in how they're using their, their brain. So again, it's a functional disorder. There's no structural problem. It's how, how information kind of flows through the brain is really what the issue is. Um, risk factors. Um, anything that makes you vigilant to dizziness um, can, can seem to contribute. So those would be things like obsessive compulsive um, disorders. Um, even certain personality traits like introversion. Um, can make you more susceptible to uh, 3PD. And I think that the probably the thing is that you're looking internally versus externally. Um, any anxiety-related disorders um, or even a family history of anxiety-related disorders can um, make you more uh, susceptible to getting 3PD. Um, in contrast, look at those, those three things on the bottom, which is what we're trying to, uh, I guess, engender in our patients, which is resilience, optimism, and a belief that life is meaningful and manageable. And those are kind of some of the things that we use in cognitive behavioral therapy, but those are some things we used to use as physical therapists. Um, so summary, in terms of treating PD, we'll, we'll go over each of these, but these are kind of the five or the four mainstays, and the fifth is a combination of the above in terms of patient education, um, vestibular rehab, um, make medication and medical management, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then um, the, what I was trying to portray here is that kind of the hypervigilance is kind of like a whirlpool kind of going around and then we're trying to throw people a lifesaver. Um, and certainly we're not contributing to that hypervigilance. Um, education, um, you should be optimistic with the patient is that it's treatable. We, we expect people to get back to their normal activities. We do tend to see a higher incidence of somebody who has like a kind of baseline um, motion sensitivity. Uh, so they might not get back to riding on a roller coaster, but they probably weren't doing that anyway. Um, once the diagnosis of 3PD is suspected or ascertained, uh, we recommend giving patients the diagnostic name, explaining that it's a well-known, common, common, and potentially treatable cause of chronic dizziness. Um, I would say the same applies certainly to concussion, um, that we expect somebody to get completely back to prior uh, activities. Um, and it's important also to look at what they're doing and what they're not doing. What are they avoiding um, to determine what goals you should be working on. So we're going to go over the vestibular rehab first. Um, there's some evidence that traditional vestibular rehab um, doesn't work. Um, but I think the vestibular rehab that we should be doing does tend to work. There is some evidence for that. Um, so meaning the difference is you can't treat a 3PD patient like a traditional like hypofunction. You can't just go ahead and aggressively have them turn their head and look at the E. Um, you, you can't do some of these things. You have to be somewhat sensitive to, um, you know, what you how quickly you're progressing them, um, because you want them to gradually kind of work into symptoms, but not go overboard. Um, so the first thing again is identifying desired activities, um, and those that the patient is avoiding, and have those be the goals. Um, using habituation or desensitization exercises. So you know, telling the patient, I'm not going to ask you about your symptoms after you do the exercise, um, you know, but I want you to work into a mild amount of discomfort. Like if you're doing something and it's not causing any discomfort, it's not doing anything for you. Um, using breathing exercises, and I really like this one, that one I learned from a, a course, and I'll have all, everybody do it with me. I could certainly use it. Um, so four square breathing. Raise your hand if you're familiar with that. All right, Steve. Um, I'm going to have you guys go ahead and try it. So it's simply taking four seconds to take a breath in, holding it for four, and going out for four, and doing it four times. Okay, so all this. Ready? Go ahead. We all feel more relaxed. <laughs> um, so again, this, it can apply to other patients too. I've used it with patients with Parkinson's or patients with a lot of anxiety about like fear. This is your fear of falling patient. You know, maybe this works. Um, 
And then again, you're trying to get them under control. You're trying to help them get control of their life um, where they're, they're losing things that they want to do. Um, so some principles of vestibular rehab, we're going to go slow. Um, we want symptoms to return to baseline within 15 to 20 minutes. And this is, this is different than what we what I generally prescribe for people with uh, like a hypofunction. Um, we want to um, keep them moving, um, but we don't want to make them too symptomatic. We also don't want to promote hypervigilance. Um, so we want to be goal-based. So the goal might be that they can, you know, go for, uh, you know, a walk with a dog in, in their neighborhood rather than that they're going to be asymptomatic with something. So we want, again, make it goal-based, make it functional, um, rather than looking at, you know, how symptomatic are they with this particular activity. Um, now, other things in terms of vestibular rehab, so addressing visual vertigo, um, decreased dependence on, on, on vision, so have them, you know, put them in conditions, eyes closed, or they have to use some sensory or vestibular information. Um, those kids there are looking at traffic, um, so, you know, put, put your patient by the window and have them watch the traffic outside. Um, optokinetics, you can, there's plenty of different things on a, you can pull up on a uh, computer screen, uh, you know, driving down a windy road, uh, walking through a crowd, things like that, and those things that you probably progress to later on. Uh, and certainly, you, there, this is an area where you can do like the virtual reality, but, and my, my thoughts are that that doesn't really apply to most of our patients until they get to a pretty high level, and they're probably walking out, they're probably done with therapy by the time they get to that level, uh, my thoughts. Um, it's also important to address fatigue with activity. We know that you know simply having somebody be physically active is going to have them, um, you know, produce dopamine and have positive effects there. Um, so medication management is something to be aware of. Um, generally, the uh, the medications that are the frontline medications seems to be the serotonin selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and to be like Zoloft or Prozac um, or sertraline. Um, and that affects how the um, the serotonin, it, it, how long it stays within that synapse. Um, about a third of the patient couldn't tolerate it, so it, a lot of times patients will go through more than one or serially, um, and then they'll try a SNRI, the their neuro epinephrine, norepinephrine um, later on. Um, they generally start slow with their dosage, um, and they don't need to be as high as they would to treat something like depression, um, and the clinical response should be about two to three months. Um, unfortunately, those patients generally have to be on that medication for about a year because the relapse um, of taking that off is so high. Um, so certainly, like, I, I think physicians would look to do other things besides medication, but medications can be uh, pretty effective for this. Um, another thing in terms of medical management, and this would go for any of the pseudo diagnosis, would be that if somebody has a migraine, that you, it want, you, you want it to be medically managed because that's almost like a continuous injury um, that would affect um, the, their outcome. So cognitive behavioral therapy, um, there's good evidence that it's effective, but again, it has to be early. So you guys remember how long uh, it, you need to have chronic dizziness to be diagnosed with 3PD? Three months. Okay, so you can't have that diagnosis if you're going to benefit from from cognitive behavioral therapy, at least the level as shown in this study. So you need to get this patient into somebody, um, a cognitive behavioral therapist, within two months um, of having their precipitating event. Um, so what is cognitive behavioral therapy um, in these two different studies? Again, I think it can vary, um, but they're looking at uh, yeah, exposing to the stimuli, um, you know, changing attention, um, encouraging, um, identifying factors, and then also just going back to that last thing, uh, understanding what 3PD is and understanding that it's really not a structural issue, uh, something that should get, should get better um, with some treatment there. Um, there is some evidence for kind of combining medication and cognitive kind of behavioral therapy. Um, cognitive kind of behavioral therapy, with the, if the, um, in addition to the medication, lower the doses that you need for the medication, which is important. Um, and it also had uh, uh, better effects. Um, some of the concepts of kind of behavioral therapy, again, I think we can use these with all our patients. Um, education is, is very important. Mindfulness, so how do we, um, we're attending to our surroundings without judgment. 
Um, you know, we're recording with a cell phone. We're just tending to what's happening with us right now. Um, managing anxiety. Um, and talk about breathing, but other things would apply like yoga and, and all those types of things. Um, cognitive structuring. So how does a patient understand the problem and how can we change it so that they can help, they can manage it? Um, self-efficacy is so, you know, how do I control this, this issue and, and how, how much control do I have in this situation? And then using imagery, um, we know that imagery can positively affect motor learning, even like a, like a stroke patient. So if it can have motor outcomes, and it also um, it seems to have behavioral outcomes for managing uh, this kind of cycle of hypervigilance. Um, so I put this one uh, for you, Steve. Um, so are the mechanisms for chronic dizziness the same as for chronic pain? And I certainly don't know. Uh, maybe Steve could answer that question a little bit better. Um, but both seems related to hypersensitization um, you know, in the absence of a structural injury um, and there's also overlaps in terms of some of the mechanisms. So somebody with a migraine, um, which is a pain disorder, is frequently going to complain of like balance issues. So this, this seem to be a, um, a connection in terms of, um, and also some of the some of the pathways between pain and vestibular kind of run through the same channels. Um, so in terms of the case study here, um, and it's showing you an example of habituation. Um, with crows and a scarecrow there. Um, does this, that patient have 3PD? Okay, here, yes, okay. Yes, and, we, and they, if you look through the, those five criteria that the patient does have 3PD, um, what likely precipitated 3PD in that patient? We'll talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna guess probably positional vertigo is based on their history, but there's certainly other things that are certainly in play there. Um, Working with a patient, what goals do you set for this patient? So, if you guys remember back to that first slide, what are some things that you would, what are, what are some, what are some, what's the goal that you would set for that patient? You can shout it out. Get back to traveling. Get back to traveling. Decrease difficulties at work. Decrease difficulties at work. Okay. So, being able to, you know, work for, you know, an hour before you need to walk around the, the office. Okay. I see there's one other big thing. Functional goal. Say so like you'd be able to do like say a full grocery shop, being able to, you know, shop for you know an hour and a half and and uh, you know get whatever they need. Um, this patient was referred for primary care therapy or um, physician. Or what other referrals might they need? What's that? Yeah, but they're they're falling outside that kind of eight weeks, but probably a, yeah, okay, I agree with you. So what? Um, <laughs> uh, no, do they need more testing? I don't know. We didn't we didn't really look at their physical exam, so we can't really answer that question. But probably they had a lot of testing. You know, if you look through the history, they might have had a lot of things. You know, and, and they're going to be kind of happy if they um, you know you can tell them kind of what's what's going on. Um, What's, what habituation exercise are you doing? Okay, so optical kinetics, you know, within their that desired goal, certainly, yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's a ton of other things depending on, I you know, don't know how severe this patient, how, how sensitive they are, but even just like, you know, walking and asking them to point out different things in the clinic that they would have to do in you know, walking down a grocery aisle, looking right and left, things of that nature. But again, make it functional and make it, you know, salient to what the patient wants to work on. Prognosis is probably good. Um, so I pulled up a couple things just from a uh, VEDA um, video, you know, I read to you. You, know, you don't know how good it feels to finally have an answer to what I've been feeling many months. I can't wait to get to to get to treating this. Um, and the second one was I feel like a sort of lightheaded feeling, and when I turn my head, it feels like my head balance is slow to connect, reconnect to my head position. I also feel like I can't think straight. So like again, the symptoms might be a little a fair bit more diffuse or non-specific than they would in with a um, like kind of what I call primary vestibular um, dysfunction. 
So some of the takeaways is that uh, 3PD is very common among the Disney patient. A diagnosis should be made from their clinical history and can be concurrent with other things. It's very treatable, um, and the kind of main studies are education, vestibular rehab, medication, and cognitive behavioral therapy, and that we can expect good outcomes with these patients. Um, so there's a couple other resources uh, for clinicians. Um, I did come across this. Um, there is a, a, a questionnaire, a, a, a patient reported um, questionnaire um, that is validated in this population. Um, so take that photo. Um, and uh, here are some references. Um, so any questions or suggestions here? Um, I have not. Um, I mean, I certainly you know have people with the balance uh, issues um, you know, due to chronic alcoholism uh, or you know as part of it, um, but not specifically they're, they're they. And again, I'm not sure if that you know if you have another. A, a, again, I think that could probably. Be combined with it, um, but certainly you have another cause of it um, that's not one of those typical cause, those precipitating factors. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Don't forget to sign in and see Steve to scan your badge too.